that what you did this morning did you wake up feel like praising him man i walk, i walked outside took a great big old breath of fresh air said thank you lord for a brisk cold morning <laughs> i thank the lord today for god being in this house amen i'm so thankful for his goodness and his mercy are you glad to be in the house of the lord today oh i thank the lord for his goodness today amen you can be seated this morning so glad that uh we are able to worship him in spirit and truth today i'm thankful we can worship any way we de desire to today we can worship him in a dance worship him in truth amen you can just have yourself a time praise god we're thankful today today's the week of thanksgiving amen i'm not ready to get to christmas yet i love christmas because if there was no jesus there'd be no christmas and there'd be no christmas songs there'd be no black friday Y'all take that in the spirit that it's given. I believe, you know, I love Thanksgiving. And I believe that we should always worship Him and give thanks to Him. And as hard as the world tries to commercialize these holidays, if you can keep centered and keep focused, amen? If you can stay focused on the real meaning of the, of the holiday, you can help Brother Hensley up there. Thank you, Jesus. And if you can stay focused on the real reason of Thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Are you thankful today for a roof over your head? Are you thankful for today for clothes on your back? Are you thankful today for shoes on your feet? Because there's some places in the world where it's even a struggle to get shoes on your feet. Amen. You know, my... My grandparents talk about, you know, they had school shoes and then they'd get a new pair of shoes each year, one for church and one for school. And you'd wear the church shoes for a year and then they become the school shoes. Lord help you if your feet grew. <laughs> but you know what? We've, we've got a lot to be thankful for in this day and age. And uh, with all the craziness that is going on, and there is a lot of craziness going on. Amen. I, I believe that if we give thanks to Him, He'll take care of us. No one can protect you like the Lord can protect you. He's my buckler and my shield. And when I give Him praise and give Him glory, give Him thanks... There was 10 lepers that Jesus touched and healed. But there was only one that he made whole. He made him whole because he came back and gave him thanks. And gave him praise. I believe there's a lot to be thankful for today. Praise God. And I am excited about what we're doing this week. Amen. We will be here working tomorrow, Tuesday, on the float. And uh, if you want to come up and help, you're more than welcome to. Amen. We are going to do our best to have it ready for Tuesday night and uh, be able to proclaim Jesus, amen, to the city of Wharton. I believe it's very important. More and more, they're trying to take uh, Christ out of Christmas. And there are those that would say, you know, well, we don't worship Christmas for this or that. Well, then don't come to church on Sunday. Because to worship on Sunday, I mean, Sunday is named after the day referred to the sun. Monday is the day after the moon. Saturday is the day after Saturn. So we can't have church during the week because every one of those. But I worship him at Christmas time because he was born, because he lived because he died hello 
and it gives us a time to focus on Jesus and his message his message of love amen for God so loved the world that he gave I love my children and I teach them the story of giving it's more blessed to give than to receive amen it really is more blessed to give than to receive I prefer to give I feel a lot better giving than I do receiving them sometimes you get uncomfortable on the receiving end of things but you know what you don't feel uncomfortable at all when you give and when you're blessing and it's not it doesn't have to be big things you know hey man, it can be little things that just I guess my wife and I we both laugh at each other because we're very it's little things that we just get excited about amen somebody brings me a stack of hot tortillas I get excited Now, Sister D, it's true now. It's good stuff. You, you, can be, you can be thankful for that. Amen. Sometimes it's just, you ever just had a cup of coffee first thing in the morning, especially on a good cold morning? You drink that cup of coffee and you just think, well, this is good. And you can thank God because, hey, I've, I'm enjoying another day, another cup of coffee. Amen. So, you know what? We have a lot to be thankful for today. And I hope that this week you will really take time. I said, Brother Bumgarner, why do you spend so much time focusing on the family and the holidays? Because I think it's so important. I think you need to focus on your family. I think you need to turn off the electronic devices. Turn off those phones. Huh? Turn off the computer. Turn off electronic devices and spend some time around the table with the family. Amen. I, I tell you this, y'all need to pray for me. I know I'm kind of meddling here, just rambling, but uh, I'll, I'll be going home to Oklahoma this week. And in, in, in my parents' house, there will be a serious game of spoons going on. And if you don't know what that's all about, I can explain it to you. Amen. But uh, that's where you sit around a table and you got six people and five spoons and everybody's got to go for a spoon. And uh, it gets kind of crazy. Y'all need to pray for me. I might be getting injured because my sisters are very mean. Sister Alba gets very dangerous in those situations. But, uh, you know, that's what makes the days like that memorable. Amen? You wake up on Thanksgiving Day and the turkey's been in the oven and they're making the dressing. And you go in there and try to sneak a cookie and you get run out of the kitchen. Any of those men know what I'm talking about? Amen. I'm thankful today, and I'm going to be thankful this week. We're going to come back tonight. We're going to have ourselves a time in the Lord. Amen. And then Tuesday, we're going to go reach our community. We're going to hand out over 300 cards from the church with candy. Amen. Letting the community know who we are, that we are here, and they are invited. Amen. Praise God. Luke, the 12th chapter. Amen. So good to have all of our friends and guests here in the house today. Thank you for coming to church this morning amen you do it because you love him if you come to church for any other reason than to worship him and love him then you're missing the whole reason for coming to church amen the benefit is he says you come worship me i'll feed you from my word and you will be stronger this week than you were last week amen can you imagine going weeks without eating and yet there are people that do that all the time spiritually Amen. In fact, if some folks ate like they came to church, they'd be, you know, poster children for countries that are without food. It's truth now. We need the Word of God. We need it to feed our soul. Luke, the 12th chapter, the 37th verse. Amen. Luke 12 and 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house 
had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and be drunken, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself. Now that's key right there. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with a few stripes for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more i want to preach and teach this morning from this thought when you make him your lord when you make him your lord lord jesus i thank you today for being in this house i pray mighty god that you would anoint these lips of clay anoint every ear to ear lord bring understanding to our mind we want to grow closer to you lord in this hour and this day that we're living in help us lord to make you the lord of our life in jesus name can somebody say in jesus name, jesus name. amen god bless you today in our text and in the beginning of our text today we we begin to to read and the first thing that Jesus is saying here is blessed are those servants now a servant amen somebody says Lord use me and then when God starts to use you you get upset because in the grandeur of things when people say Lord use me Amen. The Lord says, okay, uh, clean the bathrooms. Cook a meal for your pastor. Just threw that one out there. Mop the floors in the kitchen. Go clean the flower beds at the church. Go cut the grass at the church. Go... Clean the parking lot at the church. You say, well, Brother Bumgarner, that sounds like God using me. <laughs> sure it is. But too many times, amen, we want God to use us, and we don't want to be servants. We, we don't want to have the servant mentality. And yet, if you're going to be anything in the kingdom of God, you've got to have a servant mentality amen we're all called to serve i was so happy thirsty the lord is amen just doing great things in our ladies ministry and and our peanut brittle is just god's blessed ourselves this year and and my wife you know she she had an obligation and sister heather had an obligation thursday and so uh, you know if two women are gone one good man will have to step in Boy, that, that didn't get the response I thought I was going to get. I thought I thought I was going to have to come up here and 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 cuz I'm certified peanut brittle maker, you know. But uh I came up here and there were so many ladies working together. You know, there was there was a great team of ladies here and y'all were smiling and laughing and working together and uh 
uh, I just kind of felt like out of out of place, you know. And so I went and did some things in the office, came back and and uh, helped out a little bit, but really, you know, it was a blessing. Because sometimes you feel as a pastor, well, if if I'm not there, something. But you know what? I, I found out they can do it without me. I don't want them to. I'm gonna be here just to antagonize them and, and I mean, encourage them and. I'm trying to get you folks loosened up this morning. And y'all ain't working with me. But it takes a servant's mentality to dedicate your time to come to the house of God and to serve. Hello. I know without a shadow of a doubt I'm here to serve each one of you. And in whatever capacity that I can. And so the first thing we have to realize that we are servants of the Lord. Of the Lord. Amen. And as a servant, amen, it is my duty to serve him. And we got to get it, we got to get it to get it straight in our mind. We are serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, often we approach the Lord like he's serving us. The reason why I think a lot of folks don't get what they need from the Lord is because they approach him with the attitude of, you know, Lord, just be thankful I'm here today. Just be thankful I showed up to your house of worship. Huh? And we bring a mentality of, you know, I'm not nobody's servant. And we have to work over that. We have to get that out of our system. You know, Lord, use me. And then the Lord starts using you and say, I feel so used. Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm building a good foundation this morning. Because sometimes our pride and our arrogance goes before our fall. One thing I learned a long time ago, the Lord doesn't need me for his church to operate. Huh? It's like some of you mama tell your kids, you know, when they misbehave, talk to me again. I'll talk you out. I'll make one looks just like you. Huh? You know, the Lord kind of, you know, the Lord can do the same with us. By no means do I think that, that I'm anything other than a servant of the Lord because the Lord says, Boy, you better get straight and stay straight because I can take you out and put another one in your place. I mean, when you think about it, as Saul was committing all of his sins, God was already preparing David. So God is not fooled by us, by our attitudes, by our arrogance. Come on, I'm just going to be truthful this morning. What he wants us to do is humble ourselves and serve him. Now, when you are in a servant mentality, it is not your will. Now, I know I'm taking some time building this this morning, but that's okay. It is not your will. But with servanthood comes stewardship. And stewardship is not just stewardship of finances per se and yet the word of god tells us to buy the truth and sell it not and so we have become purchasers of the truth therefore as a servant uh, amen i am to be a good steward of truth I am to take care of it. I am to invest in it. I am to see it grow. I am to make sure that when the Lord who gives me the truth, who allowed me to buy in, when he comes, he will find me faithful. Now the word said here that, uh, you know, whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. It's very important that I live my life as a servant of the Lord so that when the Lord of the house, everybody say Jesus, when Jesus calls for his church, 
He will find me a faithful servant. Now, it doesn't matter what facade I bring to church with me on Sunday. It doesn't matter how many times I ask people to pray. It doesn't matter how much I say I believe in the Lord or believe in God. Because the faithful servant believed in the Lord, knew the Lord, and the unfaithful servant that we read about knew the Lord. But it was a matter of choice. Deciding how they were going to hold on to what they had been given. Now the good servant, amen, he is prepared. Amen. So that when the master comes, the Lord comes, amen, he can properly serve him. Amen. In fact, it goes on to say in verse 30, 39, And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. And so we, you don't know when the thief's coming. The thief doesn't go out and say, hey, I'm going to be at your house on Thursday at 12 o'clock. No, the thief watches because he is going to learn when you're not at home. He's going to learn your patterns. He goes, he's going to learn when you get up in the morning, what time you leave, when you come back. He's going to check out the neighbors to make sure, hey, man, they're gone so he can come in at an opportune time. And the devil's the same way. The thief cometh but to steal, to kill, and destroy. He doesn't love you. He doesn't love your family. He doesn't love your children. He doesn't want you to be saved. He doesn't want you to be a good servant. And so, if you'd have known when the Lord's coming, you'd be ready. In fact, I believe that's why the, the Word of God lets us... Know that no man knoweth the hour. Because if more of us knew the hour that the Lord was come, I probably wouldn't see some of you. Right. Well, he ain't coming till Monday on December the whatever. And so if he's not going to come till December, the, I'm not going to come back to church till the Sunday before. I'll pray through, get right, and everything will be good. But it's, that's not the will of God. The will of God is for us to be faithful servants until he comes. There were five wise and five foolish virgin, virgins. And the five wise guarded their lamps. Amen. They made sure there was oil in their lamps. Amen. But the five foolish, they just burned it all out. And on the outside, the lamps all probably looked the same. On the outside, they were all polished and clean. But it's not so much what's on the outside sometimes. It matters what's on the inside. So you can polish the lamp on the outside all you want. And there's a lot of lamp polishers. You look on the outside and everything looks good. But on the inside, they're empty. I'd rather be full on the inside. So that the hour that the groomsman comes... Amen. I can light the way. Hallelujah. I want to make sure there's oil in my lamp. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh in an hour when ye think not. So who then is that faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Amen. Blessed is the servant. We have to be that servant today that serves with a gladness in our heart. Now I know I'm preaching to good church folks today and I, lo I love you, but every one of us has to get a servant mentality. An attitude speaks volumes. Now our Sunday school team's in there working this morning, but your attitude... Uh, Amen. Towards those classes, speak volumes. The kids will pick up on it. Amen. They know when you care and when you don't care. Amen. You know, when you, uh, when you care, you, you put a little bit more effort into it. You got a better attitude about it. You know, one thing that I, I never could understand, when you'd go to work on Monday morning, you know, and, and uh, 
be thankful that you have a job. And there are those that come in, they're like, well, man, how 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 you doing today? Oh, I wish I was somewhere else. Well, go somewhere else. That's always been my opinion. Whether I'm on a job or in the church. Right. Shouldn't be a drudgery to come to the house of God. You don't have to work on Monday morning. You don't have to get paid either. You know, if more folks had have an attitude about work as they do doing enjoying the things of the world, we'd have a lot more productive people. Well, I know I'm preaching and meddling this morning, but I'm I'm getting somewhere. Hey Amen. You know, you ought to be thankful for the job God's given you. You ought to be thankful that you have the opportunity to be a witness to others on that job. Amen. You ought to thank God for the strength in your body to do that job. Amen. Praise God. I mean, you could be blessed with a, a father like I had who's a workaholic. He literally took the scripture, set no day above another. He worked seven days a week. We go to church Sunday morning, come home, eat lunch, go work a few hours, come back home, clean up, go back to church. <laughs> Amen. But he found joy in that. See, you got to find joy in serving the Lord. Amen. You need to find joy in your job. I'm just going to preach about that for a minute this morning. Amen. You ought to find joy in what you do. You're serving the community. Amen. If, if whatever you're doing, you're making a difference. Obviously, there was a need for someone to do the job that you do. So you're making an impact in a business. You're making an impact in an economy. And you got to understand this, that a company looks at you as an asset or a deficit. And the saddest thing is for a company to hire you as an asset and you turn into a deficit. I don't even know why I'm preaching on this this morning, but I'm going to preach on it anyhow. Praise God. You need to be the best employee you can be. First of all, you're a witness. You don't know what kind of... You, if you show up as a bad employee, then the next person that tries to come in and of like faith and they see that person, they'll say, well... Uh, I don't know. You folks are kind of lazy. <laughs> I don't want us to have that reputation. I want folks to know, man, you handle, ha hire someone from Peace Tabernacle. They're the hardest working people. Amen. They're faithful. They show up on time. Amen. They stay late if need be. They do whatever it takes to work the job. Well, boy, it's sure getting quiet here this morning. Pastor, couldn't you preach this is Thanksgiving week, Pastor? Pastor, on Thanksgiving. Come on, Pastor. Preach to us something make us jump and shout. But you know what? We need to live for God. And you live for God on your job. More so sometimes than at home. It's easy to come to church a few hours during the week and tell everybody, well, I got, I'm spiritual. <laughs> We're only here for four or five, six hours a week, but you're on that job. 40 hours plus. So you got 40 hours of living for God. Amen. You got 40 hours during the week to watch your mouth. Woo! I know I'm meddling this morning, but I'm, I'm, I'm in the Holy Ghost. You know, you got 40 hours during the week, amen, to be a witness. Amen. To either be an asset or a deficit. Always surprised me. People get upset when they get fired. One guy wants to start throwing stuff in the office. He come out of the office. I said, what you all mad about? Uh, you got to understand, your pastor's always been plain spoken. In the pulpit or in the world. Especially when somebody's... I said... You don't show up to work on time. You always leave early. You don't take care of the customers. You don't want to be here. You complain all the time. And then you want to act like a fool right now. <laughs> and there's the door. 
Amen. One of the greatest compliments my ex-boss gave me after I, re I gave my notice and left for a few months, came back, just say hello to everybody. I walked in his office, hey, how you doing, Mike? He said, I'm doing great. He said, which two of those guys out there you want me to fire so I can hire you back? Now, that's a compliment. Of course, so I joked. I said, oh, no, man, I've, I've got the greatest job in the world. I do. I've got the greatest job in the world. I don't want any other than pastoring this wonderful church. But, you know, it, that was a compliment. I just let him realize, you know, dude, when he was here, he, you know, he, he could keep up with two of these guys now. I'm just saying, when you work, you've got to be an asset. Because even in your work ethic, you are a witness. Amen. See, people want to be the Lord and not serve the Lord. People like to be the boss. People don't like people telling them what to do. My father, he was, and I know I'm mentioning him a lot today, but he was a maintenance superintendent. And he worked for a school district. Had lots of people that worked for him. And uh, he had one old boy come in complaining about doing this or that. And he said, why are you complaining? It all pays the same. Whether you're using a weed eater or pushing a mower or whatever, it all pays the same. Whatever you're assigned to, just do for that day. I guess that's what he kind of put in, put in me. It all pays the same. When I was on my job, you know, there were days when I'd have to go outside. And, and, uh, but I was an inside salesman. I was supposed to stay inside. Work that desk. Work the in but if the boss says, hey, won't you go out there and sweep the warehouse? Why would I care? It all paid the same. Go pick trash up. Okay. You're paying me. Whatever you're paying me, you know, you're, you're the boss. And as long as I'm allowing you to be boss, then you got the rule. You got the reign. And you know what? We have to let the Lord be the boss. Now, a, a Lord is a master, a person possessing supreme power and authority. A ruler. A governor. Someone that we look to, uh, you know, in our day we call them a boss. But they, in times past, would be called the Lord. Because they had a rule over us. Some have been known to be tyrants and oppressive. Amen. Even Sarah called Abraham Lord. Genesis 18 and 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying, After I am waxed old shall I have pleasure. My Lord being also old also. First Peter he, he uh, likens that scripture there and and uh, in First Peter, the third chapter, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing the gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection under their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, I know we don't like that, but that's true even today in 2015. Amen. If more men would be good husbands. Wives wouldn't have near the trouble of calling their husbands Lord. Can I just say it like that first? But like I told folks, I was born a bum. What's your excuse? But it's hard for a woman to call her husband Lord. Huh? When he's acting like a bum. Is that not truth? Now, I believe 1 Peter 100%. I 
I believe God has an order in the house. But men, we have to take our place in the order of the house too. And we live in a day and age when we've got a bunch of adolescent men who'd rather play video games than be men. More worried about partying on the weekend than taking care of their family. I thank God for men who know how to provide and be the head of the house. I know y'all thought I was going to beat up on the ladies, but no, that's not my purpose. My purpose isn't to beat up on anybody. My purpose is to speak the word of truth this morning. Amen? Amen. And I've learned this, that no woman has a problem allowing her husband to be the head of the house if he'll be the head of the house. But that requires him doing what he's supposed to be doing. Well, praise God anyhow. Sarah called Abraham Lord, whose daughters are ye are as long as ye do well and not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Now, there's a lot... A lot, of, lot to be said right there. And I know that there's some that may not agree with me, but I honestly believe that if I'm not honoring my wife and treating her with respect, you, there should be a lot more hearing this this morning. If I don't honor her and treat her with respect as a husband should a wife, amen, then I might as well not even pray. Because the Lord's saying, why are you praying, boo? You don't even know how to treat your wife. You don't even know how to treat her with respect. You're trying to get me to, to, you know, you're praying with supplication for me to do stuff for you, but you don't even know how to treat her. Why don't you learn how to treat her, son, and then come talk to me? And can I just, now I'm going to preach to the ladies for a minute, but don't y'all throw stuff at me. But you know what? You can't be disrespectful to your husband, usurping his authority, trying to rule the household around him. I'm just being truthful this morning. And expect God to hear your prayers. I think the word of God is pretty plain when it says, being heirs together. Of the grace of life. Heirs, we are joined together. Amen. That your prayers be not hindered. I'm thankful for my wife. I thank God for her every day. I'm going to get beat up today after service. That's all right. But she's a blessing. Amen. She's a blessing. And I thank God for her. I'll tell everybody. I love my wife. I'm thankful for her. I'm thankful for her relationship with the Lord, and I remind him of that every day. Amen. She challenges me to be a better Christian. Amen. And there have been times, amen, when, when, when I've had to be the head of the house, and I've had to tell her this is the way it's going to be, and she didn't like it. Right? Right. Right. <laughs> But it's all right. Because there's days when, when you just have to, as a man of the house, when, 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 not, when I've known something that just needed to be a certain way, and I've said that's the way it's going to be, she's agreed with me. She may have not agreed with me in everything, but when I said that's the way it's going to be, she said, okay. But I'll tell you this, if I was wrong, I'm man enough to go back and say, hun, I know I set the rule, and, and I said this was the way it's going to be, and it was wrong, and, and you were right about that. Would you forgive me? Now, come on, folks. If we're going to be real, we've got to be real. A real man knows when, if he's wrong, he can say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. But a good woman of God, when that husband says, I'm going to do it this way, or this is the way it's got to be, she's going to say, hun, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support you in that. She can say, and let me tell you something. She can say, hon, I don't agree with you. 
Now, she can tell me she don't agree with me, and I'll take that into my counsel. Well, praise God, now I'm this. Now, we joke about this, but this is serious stuff. But we are heirs together of the grace of life. And so, you know, it's not so much, you know, and, and believe me, it's not her serving me. I'm not no male chauvinist by any means. I, I love her. She loves me. I, I'm sorry, honey. I don't mean to embarrass you this morning, but it's just the way it's working. <laughs> I've been looking at this forever. I thought it was a snake. It better be a string. Here, hide that. I don't want no snake in the house. <laughs> but you know, There's days she gets me coffee. There's days I get her tea. There's days she cooks me dinner. There's days I cook her dinner. She's constantly working around the house. Amen. And there's days I've helped around the house. We're joint heirs together. But too many times... And I'm going to preach to, I guess I'm preaching at the men today. We get on this pedestal that I'm sitting here. I'm, they're all to serve. No, 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 no. Best way to lead a household is with a servant mentality. If my babies need to be changed and she's got her hands full, I need to go help change those babies. Is this okay this morning? Because we are going to make it to heaven together. And I don't want to do anything to hinder her prayers. And if she doesn't want to do anything, amen, to hinder my prayers. But we got to work together. And when we allow, amen, for God's order to be established in our home, when we allow God's order to be established in our home, then God's order is established in our life. Then when we pray, things happen. Prayers get answered. You see, in, in, uh, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word, amen, Jehovah, is a proper name of God in that it also comes from a Hebrew word, Adon, which we get the Adonai, and it denotes one possessed of absolute control. It denotes a master or a ruler of his subject. He goes on to say, as, as I showed with Sarah, a husband as lord of his family. And so from Adonai was the word that would often be used when, amen, to show reverence for the name Jehovah. Amen. When you would say Adonai, you were saying he is lord. He is master. He is the one who is in all control. I give him everything. When they would say Adonai, they were giving honor to Jehovah, who was the Lord of all, controlled all. Now, Baal, Baal is, is also a word used for master, amen, lowercase. It would, prefer, it would be applied to human relations as that of uh, a person skilled in some art or profession or, or some heathen deity. And the men of Shechem literally uh, when you look at the interpretation there, it is the bells of Shechem. The, these were uh, the Israel, Israelite inhabitants who had reduced the Canaanites to a condition of where they had to pay tribute. They became their masters. They became their lords. And so you would see them referred to as one who had dominion over. And you know what? There are still those spirits in the world today who want to have dominion over your life. You will serve either God or you will serve the gods of man. But there is a Lord established in your life. That's where I'm going this morning. There is a Lord established in your life. Either the Lord and Savior or the Lords of this world. But you will serve a Lord today. 
There were five lordships in the Philistines, Gath, Ashdod, Gaza, Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron. And all of these places had strongholds of the enemy. And so there are strongholds of the enemy today in our lives. And if you're not careful, you will serve a Lord who is not the Lord. There are many today who have no problem serving their Lord. They give offerings to their Lord. Amen. I always thought it was a great ideal, but then, it, but then folks got upset at me. I said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Whatever you spent a week partying in the world, that's what you give in your offering every week. Boy, I got a few chuckles. <laughs> and the reason why people aren't laughing is because they start thinking about how much they spent when they partied. <laughs> Brother Bumgarner, you out of your mind. You will never get that. <laughs> and I don't expect that. You give us unto the Lord. Amen? But we never thought about when we were given out there in the world. Amen? We never thought about the Lords that we're serving out there. You don't question the salesperson when that case of beer is $30, $40. I don't even know what it is. You don't go in there and say, Well, I just don't feel like I need to give that this week. <laughs> You want to take a 10? How about a 1? They'll laugh you out of the store. Because your Lord says you'll pay whatever price I set. Huh? When your Lord's the drug dealer. You'll pay whatever price they tell you to pay. And people do. To great extents. Amen. They'll sacrifice their own bodies. To get their fix. So who's your Lord today? Because you're serving a Lord. Either you're serving Adonai. The Lord who's above all of us. Or you're serving the Lords of this world. You don't have no complaints about paying what this, the price that the Lords of this world calls you to pay. Huh? I mean you'll. You'll lay it down and no problem. Whatever the price is, Lord, I'll pay it. Whatever the price is, Lord, I'll pay it. Just let me have my good time. Let me have my good time. My grandfather, he used to say, now when a pack of cigarettes gets over $2, I ain't buying them no more. And then when they got to $2, he said, well, when they're $2.50, I ain't going to buy them no more. He had quadruple bypass surgery. The doctors told him, if you don't stop smoking, you're eventually going to die of a heart attack. He didn't listen. He didn't stop. He didn't even try to stop very hard. I loved him, but I'm being truthful with you. And so it was a sad day, many, not many years afterwards, that he died of congestive heart failure. He was warned. He was told. But his Lord said, keep paying the price. Keep paying the price. Keep paying the price. So carton after carton he would buy. You say, Brother Bumgarner, why are you you're just, you're just killing us this morning, Brother Bumgarner? You just, come on, encourage. I'm trying to get you to live for God. Because you're going to serve the Lord of this world or you're going to serve the Lord of, of the heavens of hosts. Many people want to call the Lord their Savior. Everybody says, oh, he's my Savior. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Oh, he is my Savior. But not many people want to call him Lord. Not many people really want him to be Lord of their life. Do you know that the word Savior is only mentioned 37 times in Scripture? Yet the reference to Lord is is mentioned over 7,970 times. And even though I know that not all of those references are talking about him being the Lord of our life, uh, I would say that there is at least half of those references that are referring to him being the Lord. And so it would seem to me that even though he wants to be our Savior, it's his greater desire that you allow him to be the Lord of your life. 
Peter brings this out through his teachings. 2 Peter 1 and 10. Wherefore, the brethren, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So first thing Peter says, and I'm going to be going through this his text a lot in Second Peter there. His whole theme of this is about him being our Lord and Savior. He can't just be your Savior. He's a Savior to a lot of people. There's a lot of folks that can come to an altar and they will cry and they will repent of their sins. They'll get baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of those sins, according to Acts 2.38. They will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking of tongues, according to Acts the second chapter. They do everything that they know to do to be saved. To take those initial steps of salvation. There's a lot of folks that have come in and taken those steps. And yet they're not in the house of the Lord today. Amen. They're not living for God like they should today. And the reason is they wanted him to be their savior. But they don't want him to be their Lord. Because I don't want nobody telling me what to do. Amen. Praise God. Amen. A lot of folks don't like a pastor. They don't want pastor to be pastor sometimes. You ought to thank God for your pastor. I don't believe in being a Lord over God's heritage. Amen. I don't. I don't believe that's what God called me to do. He called me to preach the word. He called me to pastor. And sometimes pastoring, amen, is not the easiest thing because sometimes you have to tell folks, now you need to stop doing that. That's not an easy thing to have to do. I don't get any pleasure out of that. I'd rather do a baby dedication. <laughs> Praise God. Then I have to call somebody up and say, now you're doing this, you've got to stop doing that. I don't want to lord over God's heritage. Amen. But I take my responsibility very serious. And there are days when I have to finally say, okay, Amen. I prayed and I prayed, and so I've got to talk to him now, Lord. Please give me the words. Help me be nice. Help me be nice, Lord. And, and so sometimes it takes that. But you know what? The Lord wants you to live for him. To give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Hallelujah. Because if you do these things... Ye shall never fall. But you've got to be diligent. You can't just say, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. But you, gotta, you have to say, Lord, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be in control. If there's things in me that I shouldn't be there, Lord, you tell me. Amen. Get rid of them. You change me, Lord. You work on me. Too many times we, we, we try to get by with things. We ought to say, Lord... I don't want to try to get by with anything. I want you to work on me. I want you to convict me. When was the last time you said, Lord, talk to me. Straighten me out. I'm just, a, I guess, a preacher, amen, that really believes that, you know, there, there's things that I will preach and you need to follow. I, I believe that strongly. There's things I preach you need to follow. But there are things that God's going to put in your spirit. And if God puts them in your spirit, then he's working on you. And you ought to say, yes, Lord. You shouldn't try to get around them. You shouldn't try to go another way. You ought to say, okay, Lord, your will, your way. Let's go on into the second chapter of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, the second chapter and the seventh verse. And delivered just lot. Vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them. Now, I want you to see something here. The first thing, amen, the writer says, Peter says he was just. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something. This world's getting worse and worse, not better and better. And the conversation of the world isn't getting any better. Amen. And, you know, I have worked in chemical plants, construction job sites. And believe me, I've come home and I felt like I needed to take a bath spiritually because of the conversation that would go on around me of the wicked. Well, I would come home. Oh, I feel like it. Mm. I'd come home sometimes and I'd just have to go to my prayer room and pray and seek God because I felt dirty on the inside. Because the enemy's always going to come at you. He's going to try to vex your spirit. Because if he can vex your spirit, you say, what, what are you talking about? If he can get you that ugly feeling on the inside. And you go to pray, you feel like, I'm too dirty to even pray. You feel like, i got to repent, and I haven't even done anything. But the spirits of the world, they're all around us. What the writer is saying. And there is conversation, and all those conversations, amen, they're entertaining the spirits of this world. The spirits of lust and adultery and idolatry. All the time, you're battling these things, and Amen. You're constantly walking around and working around it, and you come home and you got to, you know, it's like churches until Wednesday night, and Lord, I, I can't wait till Wednesday night. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You, say, you think it was bad then? Imagine men trying to beat your door down. To have relationships with angels. So as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not rallying accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understood not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin beguiling unstable souls and heart that they have exercised with covetous practice. Cursed children. Which have forsaken the right way. And are gone astray. Following the way of Balaam the son of Bojar. Who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now you hear me right there. I was speaking earlier about what the cost was for your sin. But there are wages of unrighteousness. There is a price that you will pay. But was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice. Forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Now right there is something I want to bring to your attention. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. These are those that never have water to give. Scowling darkness they are carried about. 
It will always be somebody else's fault. It will always be somebody else's fault why I can't live for God. You know what? That's the biggest lie the devil has, especially for those that was, have been raised in a church. Well, the reason why I can't come to church is for sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so. And, and no, won't you just be truthful? You want to live like the world lives. You want to pay the wages of unrighteousness. You want to go where you want to go. You want to do what you want to do. And I learned a long time ago, you know, when I was younger, I'd say, yeah, well, I'm free, white, and 20-whatever. And that's easy to say when you're in your 20s. Because you find out real quick, you're really not as free as you think you are. You get older and you get a family, you're not as free as you think you are. But if God's given you children, your responsibility is to those children. You become a servant to those children. You become a servant to your family. You just can't go out and do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. And if there's one thing this generation needs to know, can I just preach truth today? Can I speak plainly to this adult class today? If we're spending so much money in our school system educating them on sex, and letting them know what it takes. Maybe we ought to teach some responsibility with it. Because if they're old enough to be educated about it. And they're old enough to pro procreate it with it. Then they need to understand the responsibility of it. That's truth this morning. It's not just going out and doing whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. But there is a responsibility that comes with it. An obligation to be a mom and to be a dad to that child and to raise them to be good, thriving adults. But we're so caught up in the adolescence and the sin of our flesh. That man right there has spoken a word that was so profound and so true. He used to say it when, when, when he was first preaching. He'd say it a lot. You know, I should have been ashamed when I was 48, acting like I was 28. That's what he would tell us. That's back when you was 48. <laughs> the Lord's been good to him. The Lord's been good to him, been merciful. But now he's got a witness and a testimony to tell younger men. 500 testimonies plus. But you know what? We should be, amen, this day and age, this generation, amen, we're more worried about uh, killing zombies. I'm just going to preach truth. What's the next big game for PS4 coming out? People can't even operate in society, but they can operate with a headphone in their house. I know I'm just preaching truth today. But God wants to be the Lord of your family. He wants you to serve Him and nobody else. In fact, the first commandment He says, you should have no other God beside me he he doesn't want you serving other gods he doesn't want you not being good parents to your children this whole bible is based on being a good parent and being a good leader and being being right with god and being right with your wife and being right with your husband being right with your children he says while they promise them liberty they themselves are the servants. Let me back up. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. They allure through the lust of the flesh. Through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. In this day and age you know. The devil doesn't say. 
Now, when you have this in affair, it's going to ruin your family. When you're unfaithful, it's going to tear your family apart. When you act this way, you're, you're going to lose your children. You're going to lose your house. Everything that you've worked for is going to be gone. It's going to be a good time. We're going to have a good time. Come on. Come on over here. And they use everything they can allure. Young minds. This day and age of immodesty. Huh? Everything that they're promoting, they're promo promoting with some immodestly clad woman. That's how it sells. What are they doing? Hey, I'm going to appeal to the lust of their flesh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them some eye candy. Them men, they'll be drawn to that. Because men are drawn by their eyes. So the world knows, the advertising world knows how to draw them in. Lust of the flesh with much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. And so the world's saying, come on, you can have a great time. But they're really just being servants of corruption. They're bound by sin. They can't get loose from. Of the same as he brought in bondage. A pastor friend of mine, he was walking into Walmart and there was a woman. She was hiding. And he saw her. He thought, oh Lord, what's going on with this woman, you know? He saw her all cower down. And uh, he said, can I... Man, are you okay? She says, oh, I don't want to be in chains anymore. No, ma'am. God can, God can touch you. God can deliver you. God can release those chains. Oh, I don't want to be bound. I don't want to be in bondage. He said, ma'am, I'm going to pray for you. God's going to help you. And he starts praying with her. And while he's praying with her, some officers show up. Because he had been telling her, ma'am, you just got to lay it down. You know, he thought she was chained, shackled spiritually. He was... Then she started laying down the CDs and she started laying down all the other stuff she had shoplift. <laughs> he stepped back real quick because he realized she needed both spiritual and he said the good thing was, she says, look, if when I make bail, I'm coming to your church. <laughs> That's what she needs. But you know what? She was crying out, I don't want to be in physical bondage. But the truth was, she was already in spiritual bondage. She was already bound by the corruption of sin that would drive her to a place where she would have to, to shoplift. And so there's lots of folks like that today. Amen. They think they don't want to be in physical bondage, but what they really need is deliverance from the spiritual bondage. Amen. Most times people battling things, if they could get spiritually free, amen, they wouldn't have to worry about ever be, being physically bound in this world again. Hallelujah. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse within than the beginning. And what's he saying here? It's those that have been raised in truth and those that... Amen. God has delivered you. You escaped the pollutions of this world. And, and God has filled you with the Holy Ghost. Cleaned you up inside. And you have decided to follow Jesus. But then you get caught back up in the lords of this world. And you get entangled again. And bound again by the gods of this world. He said it's going to be worse with them than in the beginning. 
For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. What happens is, oh, I want you to be my Lord, my Savior, but, but Lord, when you start telling me I have to live a certain way and, and to do certain things, Lord, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to obey your word. I don't want to live a life that's separated from the world. I still want to be a part of the world, but I'm going to tell somebody this morning, you can't be a part of the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God at the same time. You're either going to serve the lords of this world or you're going to serve the Lord of the kingdom of heaven. Going to chapter 3, 2 Peter 3 and 2, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the, pro, by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. He's always referring to him as his Lord. Peter's saying, you know what? He's more than my Savior. He is my Lord first. If he says it, I'm going to do it. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And if there is a great deception in the world today is that there are many who doesn't believe that Jesus is coming for his church. If there's a great deception in the world today is that things are just keeping on, keeping on like they always have. Amen. We're just going to get technologically better and, and life's just going to keep getting better and things are just going to keep going on as they always have. But I want you to know just like Jesus came the first time, he's coming back again. He is going to rapture his church away and we better be ready For this they willingly are ignorant of. By the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that was then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Peter's given a warning here. He said at one time in the earth it was all water. But God spoke a word and now there is an earth uh, where there once was just water. And now there's a separation. And yet we know that there's going to be a spoken word. And when God speaks the word that this present earth will be consumed with fire. So we need to understand just as he spoke a word and water covered the earth and the world perished he will speak a word and fire will consume the earth and all will perish but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and as a thousand years as one day the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. But is long suffering to us, Ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, that's our problem. We think we've got it figured out. We don't think the Lord's ever going to come again. We don't think that, you know, I can live any way I want to live. I can just do what I want to do, and it's not going to cost me anything. But the Lord will call your number. He will visit your house. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are then shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things which shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwell righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. 
as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destructions. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow. It is the will of God for you to grow. He wants to be the Lord of your life. He wants you to obey this word. He wants you to be faithful to the house of God. He, and He wants you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our the one who has rule over us. When I learn of Him, I'm able to live for Him. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. He wants to be our Lord as well as our Savior. And there's lots of folks that can call Him Savior, but can you really call Him your Lord today? Can you really say, I am living for Him, I am following His Word. If He come to my house today, and that's the thing, it's not so much that He visits, visits us here, but what will He find if He visits your house? Romans 1 and 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among you, all nations, for his name. Obedience to the faith. When he's your Lord, then you have no problem being obedient. When he's your Lord, you have no problem obeying him. Hello. Romans 5, 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. We know that Adam sinned, and his disobedience brought unrighteousness, brought sin into the world. We were all made sinners because of his disobedience. But because Jesus obeyed the will of the Father. <laughs> and died at Calvary. Through Him, we can be made righteous. Romans 6.16 Know ye not that to whom ye yield your... Ser know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. His servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death... Or of obedience under righteousness. You make the choice. You determine whether he's going to be your Lord and Savior. You determine what goes on in your house. You determine what you allow on the inside of your soul. Yes, yes, Second Corinthians 10 and 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We've got to obey him. We've got to obey His Word. We've got to follow His Word. We have to make Him the Lord of our life. I'm coming to a close. You are not your own. But you are bought with a price. I read the scripture before. If one man brought sin into the world, one man brought righteousness. He paid a price. 1 Corinthians 6 and 14, And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by His own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? So I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? That's the Word of God that is a pastor reading. You're going to take this Vessel that should belong to the Lord 
And you're just going to whore it out to the spirits of the world? That's what a harlot is. He says, God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I don't want to be joined to the things of this world because Paul said it's just like when you would cheat on your wife with a harlot. And just as my wife and I are one flesh, when I am full of the Holy Ghost, me and the Lord are one spirit. Now, you may not cheat on your wife in the flesh. But are you cheating on the Lord in the spirit? Because you're letting another God come in. Israel, what's your problem, Israel? You're not happy just serving one Lord. You want to build these idols over here and build these groves over there and you're wanting to worship all these other images. And that's what idolatry is in this day and age. It's images. That's why pornography. Pornography is nothing more than modern day idolatry. Where men feast upon the eyes of the flesh. And we got to say, Lord... I don't want there to be anything separating me from you. I don't want anything. I don't want to join my spirit to any unclean spirit. Because when I do that, there's an unfaithfulness on my part to you. And I'm not allowing you to be the Lord of my life. First Corinthians seven twenty. Will you stand with me this morning? Let every man abide in the same calling, wherein he was called. Art thou called, being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Too many times we want the benefits of serving God. The shouting, the worshiping the prayers and the praise and that's all that's wonderful those are benefits but before I can enjoy the benefits I've got to be the servant I've got to be the submitted servant it says Lord you are my Lord that is your word I'm going to do what it tells me to do I'm going to be obedient Lord I'm going to serve you Lord first What's the word of God say? And I'm coming to a close. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added. But our go what we do in this day and age is we seek all these things first. And then we seek God. I wonder today as I come to the end. I'm opening these altars. Is he really the Lord of your life? Is he really the Lord of your life today? Are you caught up serving the world, the lords of this world? I want to serve you, Lord. I want to obey.
obey you, Lord. I want to do your will.